Mizan Creek Open House. This conference is dedicated to Mizan Creek and related topics and locations. And here you can socialize with other collectors, check out all the books for sale, learn about recent research and see some great fossils. The weather today is good. So I hope uh, while you're here, you can take some time to enjoy the gardens and grounds here at Cantini, not Cantigny, Cantini. <laughs> and take a look at the display of Mexican folk art that's called Alabrijes, which is uh, still out amongst the garden. And at lunchtime, remember Bertie's Cafe is located uh, here in the visitor center, just out around to the right. We have four speakers today and re request that you hold all the questions to the end of each lecture. Our first speaker today is Dr. Victoria McCoy from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. And the title of her lecture is The Tully Monster, Identity, Morphology, and Ecology. All right, well, thank you so much for having me here and thanks for the great introduction. Um, I'm really excited to have the chance today to talk about my favorite Maison Creek fossil, the Tully Monster. So the Tully Monster is an extinct animal known only from the Maison Creek fossil site, a site I suspect you all are familiar with, right? It's this exceptional world famous fossil site, covers a large part of Illinois, with the most famous outcrops and collecting localities right around Chicago. Now, about 306 million years ago, when this was a living ecosystem rather than a fossil site, the Maison Creek looked kind of like this reconstruction to the right, um, a near shore coal swamp with some big rivers running through it, bringing the coal swamp animals and plants into a near shore marine or brackish delta, and also then burying animals living in the delta. And the Tully monster would have been one of these marine or brackish swimming animals in the Delta itself. So the Tully monster was first discovered by this man, Francis Tully, in the 1950s. Uh, so Tully, when he first saw it, knew that he could not figure out what it was. He didn't know what it was or even what it was related to. So he took these fossils to the paleontologists at the Field Museum to try and get some help identifying them, but they were just as stumped as he was. And the reason for this is the very strange morphology of the Tully monster. So pictured in the center is a fossil of the Tully monster. It's a soft bodied animal, could grow to be about a foot long or longer. It had a cigar or torpedo shaped body with a triangular tail fin at one end, segments in the body, and then at its front end and its head, that's where the really strange features occur. So it has eyes on the end of a rigid horizontal bar, much wider than the body, and a very elongated front of its body into this proboscis ending in a claw-like structure. And so because of this, it really became a mystery what the Tully monster was. Now, because there are so many specimens that are so well-preserved with soft tissue, and because the Tully monster was so interesting, uh, there have been many, many studies on the Tully monster in the 70 years or so since it's been discovered. But despite that, many things remain mysterious. And the first one we'll talk about is the morphology. So what exactly did it look like? Now, you might think we actually know fairly clearly what the Tully monster looked like, right? We have all these full body fossils with a lot of detail. You probably can picture in your mind what the Tully monster looked like, uh, but there are things that still remain disputed or debated. Um, and of course, it's not just the things that don't preserve very well in fossils, like internal organs, like color patterns, cellular details, but even some of the major features of the Tully monster that seem to be well preserved in the fossils are interpreted differently. And I think the best way to illustrate this is with some illustrations. So you can see here a number of artistic reconstructions of the Tully monster. And they're all very clearly Tully monsters. They all have the main features that you see that correspond very well to the features in the fossils and so on. But there are a lot of differences between them, even in the main parts of the body, the things like the proboscis, the eye bar, and so on. So I'm going to focus today just on three of these features, point out how they're reconstructed differently, and then go and look at some fossils and see what information there is in the fossils to determine, you know, what is the most likely accurate reconstruction. Starting with the tail. So there are a number of different ways the tail is commonly reconstructed. There are kind of differences in size and shape, number of fins, whether it has fin rays or not. But the biggest, the biggest difference between these is whether the tail is horizontal or vertical. And it looks like, as you can see here, that a horizontal tail is the most common reconstruction. 
And the reason for this is fairly clear. When you see the fossils, they're almost always preserved in this orientation. They're kind of flattened from top to bottom in the plane of the eye bar, which was you know, the most rigid structure that probably controlled the way the Tolly monsters, when they died, the orientation in which they landed on the sediments. And the tail almost always appears to be this big flat triangle in the same plane as the eye bar. And it's pretty much always agreed that the eye bar was horizontal. It just doesn't make much sense as a vertical structure. So because of this, I think most people just thinking about the Tolly monster from the fossils they've seen, the tail just strikes them as being horizontal. But in a way, this is a little bit surprising because in the scientific literature about the Tolly monster, there's pretty much unanimous agreement that the tail was in fact vertical. And I think what causes this discrepancy is that the very tip of the tail is very rarely preserved. And often there's not much detail about the edges of the fins. Um, and the reason that's important is that when the tip of the tail is preserved, and when the edges of the fins are very clearly preserved, it becomes clear that the Tolly monster tail is asymmetric. It's not this nice symmetric triangle or diamond, but in fact, the two sides of the fins are slightly different sizes, and the very tip of the tail does not point straight. It always veers off to one side in these fossils. And of course, if you have an animal that probably moves its tail to help it swim, if it's a horizontal tail with right left asymmetry, this just would not work very well. It would be, have trouble holding its position and move straight. However, a vertical tail with top bottom asymmetry is in fact extremely common among fish and other swimming animals because that can work very effectively. So this asymmetry was recognized in the very earliest studies of the Tolly monster and immediately suggested the tail was in fact vertical. And even looking at some of these ones where the tail appears to be a nice flat triangle in the same plane as the eye bar, um, you can see in many cases a fold as indicated by that white arrow in the top picture where the tail was a vertical tail that kind of flopped the side during fossilization and was preserved in this kind of flattened looking way. Moreover, some specimens in the normal top bottom flattened orientation do not have a nice broad triangular tail, but have a tail that looks kind of like a crumpled up line, like in that bottom picture, indicating probably a vertical tail that just didn't flop over very nicely, but was just kind of crushed vertically during preservation. So I think it's safe to say that a vertical reconstruction is in fact a little bit more accurate. But this leads to a question, right? If you have a vertical asymmetric tail, then what was the orientation? Which side of the tail was up? and which side of the tail was pointing down. And I will say this is not clear from the fossils alone. If we're just doing a very direct interpretation of the fossils, we don't know which side was up and which was down. But we'll come back to this after we talk about the identity because there are some clues to the orientation of the tail in the identity of the Tolly monster. Okay, moving on to a second feature. Another major feature of the Tolly monster is the proboscis. So you can see there are, again, various different ways that the proboscis is interpreted and reconstructed. Again, all of them give the sort of same Tolly monster feel. They all match quite closely with a general look at the fossils and so on, but there are variations. And the key one we're gonna talk about now is whether the proboscis is fully flexible along its length, the way it is commonly reconstructed, or is it more accurate to think of it as having a few bends? And again, we'll come back to our Tolly monster holotype. Um, and you can see the proboscis there at the front of the body, sort of folded over the body. And you can maybe tell from this fossil already what seems to be the more likely interpretation. And again, I think the issue here for interpreting the proboscis is that there are actually quite not very many Tolly monster specimens where the proboscis as a whole is preserved. Even when the proboscis is preserved, it's most commonly like these fossils pictured here just a very short section of the proboscis that really doesn't show curving or bending. However, because there are many thousands of Tolly monster specimens, even if a very small proportion have a, a longer portion of the proboscis preserved, this is enough to see some patterns. So I've looked at 729 specimens with some part of the proboscis preserved, and most were like the ones in the previous slide where you really couldn't tell whether it bent or curved, but 153 of them show sharp bends. 
like the specimens pictured here, with the red arrows indicating where there seem to be sharp bends. And not only do they have these sharper bends with only limited curvature between them, but they're almost always in the same spots. After all, we can imagine if the proboscis were, for example, a rigid structure, it could break during fossilization, given the appearance of sharp bends. But that you would think would happen kind of randomly throughout the proboscis. Um, when you, but when you have these bends always in the same places, that seems to indicate that it's more likely that it had these bends in life. Also, only 33 show what could be a curve. And that would be like the specimen pictured here, where the proboscis maybe shows a smooth curve indicated by the red line, but I think it could also be consistent with bends. So based on this, I would argue that the most likely interpretation is the proboscis has some kind of internal joints and it could only bend with a very large degree of motion in just a few places. Um, but it probably had some, a little bit of flexibility between these joints. And it seems to have had two joints, one where the proboscis attaches to the body and one in the middle of the proboscis, and then possibly where the claw attaches to the proboscis, although that less clearly shows movement. Now, again, just like the tail, the question is, what is the range of motion then of the proboscis? And this we don't know. Even looking at the fossils and seeing sort of what range of motion appears to be preserved, it could be that the processes of transport and fossilization result in, say, hyperextension of joints or breaking joints, moving the proboscis to a position that it could not hold in life. So we don't know yet the full range of motion, but it seems fairly clear the proboscis was a movable structure and it moved largely at joints. Moving on to the third feature, the eye bar the other major feature of the Tolly monster body that really kind of defines it as this interesting animal. And again, you can see there's a variety of different reconstructions. In some cases, the eye bar is on the top of the body. Sometimes it's below the body. And sometimes it even seems to kind of run through the middle of the body to give this look of two stalks extending out of the sides of the body. And again, we can see when we look at the fossils where these different interpretations come from. The eye bar is this rigid structure that's often preserved three-dimensionally, but with this type of flattening from the top to the bottom, you would get the eye bar looking like the exact same position, you know, regardless of whether it was at the top of the body, the middle of the body, or below the body. But again, because we have so many specimens, there are occasional specimens that don't have this typical type of flattening. They have a more lateral preservation, or like this one here that I really like, where it's kind of folded over the head. And you can see in these cases, the proboscis does kind of sit at the edge of the body. So it doesn't seem to run through the middle of the body, um, but rather that it's not attached to the body for most of its length. Also something like that isolated eye bar, again, that seems very unlikely to happen if it's buried in the middle of the body, but if it's only attached at the center, then it's easier to see how it could be detached through decay. However, the specimen that is most informative is the one pictured here. This was described um, in, I think, the original 1960s paper, or second one maybe, um, doing a really detailed morphological investigation of the Tully monster. So in this specimen, the Tully monster is replaced by pyrite. And you do get pyrite coatings on lots of Maison Creek fossils, but Tully monsters are more commonly just this sort of discoloration on the concretion. But it, interestingly enough, for this specimen, the eye bar was pretty much fully pyrotized and still somewhat three-dimensional. And the body wall near the eye bar was also fully pyrotized and somewhat three-dimensional. And everything else was poorly pyrotized. So it had a little bit of pyrite, but didn't really hold together as a solid structure. So when this was dissolved out of the concretion with acid, all that remains is what's in that inset, the lower inset, a little bit of the body wall with the eye bar. Now it is still flattened, but there's enough three-dimensionality left to show that the eye bar sits outside the body wall and only attaches at one spot in the middle. So these authors reconstructed it as in the upper inset with the eye bar below the oval-shaped body. So again, this is evidence that it does not run through the middle of the body. And I also just wanted to comment here, you know, that in the 60s, I think dissolving this out of the concretion was the best option to try and see it as a 3D animal. But of course, today we have many better ways to look at pyrotized specimens buried in concretions, such as CT scans. 
So if you have, or if you find a pyrotized Tolly monster, you know, instead of dissolving it out, talk to me or talk to anyone who has connections to a CT scanner and we'll get it scanned rather than dissolving it and maybe see a, a much more of the Tolly monster in three dimensions. Okay, but so even with this evidence strongly suggesting that the Tolly monster doesn't run through the middle of the body, which is generally agreed upon, you know, most of the reconstruction showed it is either dorsal or ventral, the question becomes, you know, is it dorsal on top of the body or is it ventral sitting beneath the body? And again, we'll leave this as a question for now. It's not clear from the fossils, but we'll come back to this again when we get to the identity. Because we do know from some laterally preserved specimens that the eye bar opposes the tip of the tail. So, and the way we can tell this is in these somewhat laterally preserved specimens, we can kind of see which features are on the same side of the body. So the eye bar, the center of the eye bar, always matches up to this medial structure, which is indicated by the black and red arrows. And the normal top-down preservation, this runs through the middle of the body, which is why it's called the medial structure. But in this somewhat lateral preservation, it can be observed that it runs along either the top or bottom of the body. And whichever side it's on is the same side the eye bar is on. In contrast though, the tip of the tail always points toward the other side of the body. So if the eye bar is dorsal, the tip of the tail points down, whereas if the eye bar is ventral sitting below the body, the tip of the tail would point up. So if we can figure out where any of these features sit, the eye bar, the medial structure, or the tip of the tail, we can figure out the others as well. Okay, so to summarize the morphological features we discussed, the tail, despite variable interpretations, was most likely vertical and asymmetric. We don't yet know whether the end points up or down. The proboscis had really two sharp bends, but was not fully flexible through its length, although it had some flexibility between the bends. Um, but we don't know the full range of motion. And the eye bar fairly likely does not run through the center of the body. But we don't know yet whether it was dorsal or ventral, but it was on the opposite side of the body as the bend at the end of the tail. And of course, there are other features we could discuss as well, but I thought that these three were the most interesting and the most relevant for sort of understanding what the Tolly monster would have looked like as a living animal. Okay, so that at least addresses somewhat the mystery of the morphology. Of course, there are things we don't know about it, but some of the disputed interpretations actually can be solved by a closer look at the fossils. So moving on to the second question, the identity. So what is the Tolly monster and what is it most closely related to? This, of course, is the classic mystery of the Tolly monster and the area in which most research has been focused. And this, so the goal, of course, is to place the Tolly monster in the family tree of life. Because, you know, if we know what the sister groups are, what it's most closely related to, that tells us what type of animal it is. And I'm doing this out of order from my title, you know, talking about morphology first, then identity because in the end, identity is based on morphology. Now for living animals, of course, we use things like DNA to figure out what they're most closely related to. But in fossils, pretty much always, you just have to look at its morphological features and from that, figure out what it looks most like and therefore what it's most closely related to. So for the Tolly monster, of course, the reason we have this you know, enduring mystery is because its morphology is so unusual specifically the eye bar and the proboscis. Now there are lots of animals that have eyes on stalks and there are lots of animals that have this elongate proboscis, but it's not very common to have them together. Also, they're not these two features together. They don't tell you that it has to be a specific group, but rather almost every major group of animals has individual species with these features, but their close relatives don't have those features. So we can't use the eye bar and the proboscis to say, oh, the Tolly monster has to be related to this species, therefore it belongs in this group. And even if we ignore the eye bar and proboscis, we then have the opposite problem because the rest of the Tolly monster's body is really kind of common and generic. There are all sorts of different animals across all sorts of different phyla or different groups that have this kind of cigar torpedo shaped soft body with segments and with a triangular tail fin. So because of this combination of generic features and very unusual features, when the Tolly monster was first described in 1968, 
the authors just said they cannot confidently place the Tolly monster in any existing phylum, in any existing major group of animals. Now, that doesn't mean that they thought it belonged to its own group, um, just that they didn't know where to put it. Because generally, since 1968, the general consensus has been that the Tolly monster should belong in a modern group of animals. And a phylum is just a word for a big group of animals. So chordates, which are vertebrates and their relatives are a phylum, mollusks, which include you know, things like snails and slugs and octopi as a phylum and so on. And the reason for this, that the tolly monster should fit in a living phylum is its age. So the Carboniferous, the Maison Creek was like 306 to 309 million years old. Although this is quite old, it's actually too young in sort of a geologic scale to expect to have any animal that doesn't belong to a, to a living group of animals. Um, pretty much everything that's around during the Carboniferous that's been identified does fall into a known group. And although we do have fossils, of course, that are only distantly related to living animals, they tend to be much older, on the order of 500 million years old. So the general consensus that we should be able to figure out what the Tolly monster is related to, it should fit into a modern group. And because of the preservation of the Maison Creek, we should be able to figure out what this is. Because the Maison Creek fossils, of course, are preserved inside these concretions. And concretions are very well known for two things, exceptional preservation of soft tissue morphology, which as we've already discussed, is the main way to figure out the identity of fossil animals. But concretions also have exceptional preservation of biomolecules. And where morphology fails, biomolecules may actually help us figure out the identity of the Tolly monster or other things. And DNA, for example, is a type of biomolecule that's, of course, very useful today. Now, we're not likely to ever get DNA out of Maison Creek fossils. They're just much too old. But there are other types of biomolecules that preserve better and will maybe be retained in the concretions that can give clues about the identity of the Tolly monster. But the initial hypotheses of what phylum the Tolly monster belonged to were all based on morphology. And in the years since 1968, there are really four hypotheses that have been come up in the scientific literature, two of which are well supported. So first is the mollusk hypothesis. This is one of the well supported ones. And this is the idea that the Tolly monster was some kind of free swimming sea slug or sea snail. And this was based on comparisons from the Tolly monster to a living sea snail called a heteropod gastropod. And that one of them is pictured here. They're about the same size as the Tolly monster. They have soft body. Um, the tail is fairly transparent, so you can't see it very well in this, in this picture, but it is a vertical triangular tail with a very similar shape to the Tolly monster. And most interestingly, heteropod gastropods, these specialized sea slugs today, have um, an elongate anterior proboscis ending in a toothy radula and eyes on a horizontal bar. But this didn't ever quite become the, you know, the definite answer because there are also a number of problems with this. The first is that swimming sea snails and sea slugs have the thing called a swimming fin. And that's that big circular fin on the back of this gastropod, which the Tolly monster does not have. Also, slugs and snails of all sorts, including the sea slugs and sea snails, do not have segments. And then finally, Heteropod gastropods are actually a type of snail, so they do have a shell when they're a baby, and these shells have a fossil record. And we know that this group of, of sea snails only evolved in the Jurassic 100 million years or so after the Tolly monster, making it very unlikely that the Tolly monster was actually a heteropod gastropod. Um, but this particular type of sea snail tells us that mollusks can evolve a Tolly monster-like body plan. Then some people have suggested a segmented worm identity, such as an annelid. And pictured here is sort of the reason why there are some annelids that have a proboscis and eyes on horizontal stalks. Um, but this is not very well supported because other than the similarities in proboscis and eye bar, there's just not very much that makes a Tolly monster look like a segmented worm. Uh, then third, we have the arthropod hypothesis. So arthropods are things like bugs and scorpions and spiders. 
And generally speaking, the Tolly monster does not look much like an arthropod, so this is not well supported in the literature. But some authors have pointed out that there are some fossil arthropods that do have a proboscis and do have eyes on stalks. So that's pictured here. That's this thing, Opabinia. And Opabinia, by the way, is one of these Cambrian things that doesn't fit neatly into living groups of animals, but they're thought to be a close arthropod relative. But again, there are many problems with an arthropod affinity. And then finally, the second well-supported hypothesis is the chordate hypothesis. And this was an is an interesting one. It was first suggested in 1991, and it was actually not based on the proboscis and eye bar, unlike the other hypotheses. It was really based on similarities between the rest of the Tolly monster body and the conodons. And conodons are an extinct group of vertebrates. And remember, chordates are vertebrates and their relatives. So conodonts do kind of have pop eyes, and they do have elaborate toothy mouths, but they don't have an eye bar or a proboscis. However, an eye bar and a proboscis is not inconsistent with a vertebrate identity. There are many fish larvae, like this larval dragonfish, that have eyes on huge stalks, much more elaborate than the tolly monster eye bar. And there are also fish living today that have an elongate anterior proboscis, like the elephant nose fish pictured here. It has a proboscis that's just as long relative to its body as the tolly monster, and its mouth is at the end of the proboscis. So although I'm not aware of any fish that has an eye bar or eye stalks and a proboscis, both are certainly possible within the vertebrate or chordate body plan. Okay, so this was kind of where the field sat with these four hypotheses, and especially the mollusk and chordate hypothesis kind of fighting it out in the literature. Then in 2016, there were two new large-scale analyses of the Tully monster, which both independently came to the same conclusion. So these two different groups looked at more than a thousand specimens of the Tully monster. They re-examined the morphology to try and clarify any uncertain features, try and identify any diagnostic features. And we looked at the morphology, not just in what the features looked like, but how they were preserved compared to other Maison Creek fossils. And so the first of these was a project that I was leading. And this was just looking at the whole body, trying to clarify all the morphology. So it's kind of like the different things we worked through in the morphology section of this talk, just looking at the features and trying to tease out what the fossils actually show. And we identified this medial structure that I've mentioned before actually as a key feature to identify the Tully monster. So it's very faint in most fossils and difficult to see and a very difficult to photograph, although I think in this fossil you can see it fairly well. The white air was pointing to it and it's this thing. So this is a medial structure with the typical preservation where the tully is flattened from top to bottom. As I showed in a previous picture, when it's flattened side to side, this medial structure runs along either the top or bottom of the body. Now it's two-dimensional, unlike the eye bar, it never sticks up from the surrounding rock. It's straight-sided and it's light in color. And this was previously interpreted as a gut trace, which sort of made sense and made it non-diagnostic because many different groups of animals have a very simple straight gut running through the body. However, gut traces in the Maison Creek across all phylums tend to be preserved fairly similarly. Like in the top picture of Gilpicthes green eye here, they tend to be somewhat irregular, they tend to be mineralized, so they're three-dimensional and kind of dark in color. So very different from the Tully monster medial structure. In contrast, however, there is one feature that is preserved just like the medial structure, and that is the notochord of Gilpicthes green eye. It is sort of smooth-sided, it's two-dimensional, it's light in color, um, and in the lateral preservation, the side-to-side -side flattening that you see in Gilpicthes, it runs along at the top of the body. So based on preservation, we thought, well, the tall, the some medial structure is very unlikely to be a gut trace, but in fact, it looks much more like a notochord. And this was really interesting because the notochord, as you might guess from the similarity in name, is the diagnostic feature of the chordate phylum, meaning the Tully monster, if it has a notochord, it has to be a vertebrate or a vertebrate relative. But of course, this is just one feature. Um, but we went through and looked at every feature of the body and found that they were all indicative of or consistent with the Tully monster being a vertebrate. And so I just listed here all of our interpretations. Again, they all make sense with a vertebrate identity. Another really interesting one are the myomeres. 
So myomeres are the segment blocks, the muscle blocks specifically that vertebrates and chordates have. So, you know, the Tolly monster we decided is a chordate, its segmentation has to be these chordate myomere muscle blocks. And we observe that some very well-preserved Tolly monsters have a diagnostic W-shaped their segmentation, and only vertebrates have W-shaped segments. Things like arthropods and segmented worms have straight segments instead. And one feature that's critical are actually the eyes. And this is where we come to the second paper in 2016. Rather than looking at the whole body as a whole, they really focused on the eyes because things like vertebrates have, for example, very complex eyes. So if you can figure out eye structure, that can actually tell you some things about what type of animal it is. So they looked closely at the eyes of Tolly Monster and found that it seems to have sometimes a lens preserved and maybe a retina making it a slightly more complex eye than it was thought that maybe it could have been. They did chemical analyses to find that the black color in the Tolly monster eyes is due to the pigment melanin. And melanin is just a dark black pigment that's found in all sorts of different animals, especially in the eyes, and that tends to fossilize very well. So having melanin alone didn't really narrow it down, but using a scanning electron microscope, they further figured out that the melanin is not just dis dispersed as a molecule in the eyes, but it's packaged into pigment granules called melanosomes. And that's that picture here of these little, little circular and rod shaped things. And this was interesting because although lots of things have melanin, not every group of animals has melanosomes. Arthropods, for example, rarely or never have melanosomes. So the presence of melanosomes alone kind of rules out an arthropod affinity. But, but moreover, they found that there were two different shapes of melanosomes, the round meatball melanosomes and the elongate sausage-shaped melanosomes. And these were fossilized in the eyes in separate layers. And this was really interesting because this suggested the Tolly monster eyes had layered structures in the retina with different melanosome shapes in different layers. And it turns out this type of layered structure in the eyes is only found in vertebrates, making this kind of a smoking gun for a vertebrate identity for the Tolly monster. So once we knew the phylum that the Tolly monster belongs to, we then did this phylogenetic analysis, so building this family tree and figuring out where the Tolly monster sits, and figured out it was closely related to lamprey and hagfish. So this makes it a vertebrate, but it doesn't have mineralized bones or teeth, it just has cartilage supporting its various, you know, internal structures and its and other um, proteins making up its teeth. However, so then we can rule out these other hypotheses. The mollusk, annelid, and arthropod can all be crossed out, saying that the Tolly monster is in fact a chordate similar to conodonts. But this did not convince everyone. Since 2016, there have been two papers that have tried to counter the two 2016 papers. So in 2017, a paper was published basically saying the morphological interpretations aren't really as convincing as they could be. They said you can get very similar morpho morphology for an invertebrate, and they suggested an invertebrate affinity is more plausible, but didn't say what invertebrate, just saying the morphology alone can't tell you that much. So this kind of ruled out, so this kind of opposed my, my project, the whole morphology project. Then in 2019, Another paper then opposed this eyeball smoking gun um, layered melanosome structure in the eyes. So in 2016, it was thought that only vertebrates had this, this structure, the distinct layers of differently shaped melanosomes. But in 2019, a paper was published showing that some cephalopods like the octopus have this as well. And this makes sense. You know, the eyes of cephalopods and of vertebrates are both very complex and very similar to each other, despite having different evolutionary affinities. So that suggests the layering in the eyes of Tolly monster is actually not diagnostic of a vertebrate affinity. And worse yet, octopus is a mollusk. So this reopens the idea of the second hypothesis that's very well supported by morphology, the mollusk hypothesis. So this was kind of troubling, right? It seemed like we had done everything that could be done with the morphology with these various papers, and yet it wasn't convincing to everyone. So this seemed like maybe morphology was not going to answer the Tolly monster identity question. However, fortunately, identity can, is not just based on morphology, but also chemistry. 
Um, and this is where biomolecules come in. So for example, arthropods have their structural tissues made of chitin and vertebrates have the protein keratin to make up things like hair and nails, the teeth of lamprey. So if we could figure out, say, if the Tolly monster, what its teeth are made of, that could help distinguish these hypotheses. So mollusks like sea slugs and sea snails have teeth made out of chitin on their radula. Arthropods too are fully covered in a chitinous exoskeleton. That's why bugs kind of crunch if you step on them. So if the Tolly monster's teeth are chitin, it's probably an arthropod or a mollusk. In contrast, annelids or segmented worms, now they actually have a lot of chitin throughout their body, but their mouth parts specifically are made of a protein collagen. And then chordates like vertebrates, now most of us like, like humans have mineralized teeth, but the relatives that we think were most closely related to the Tolly monster, lamprey and hagfish, have teeth made of the proteins keratin and collagen. So this was another project I was involved in. We used Raman spectroscopy, and this is a technique that Yasmina Wieman had really pioneered using Raman spectroscopy to look at organic preservation in fossils. Now, chitin and keratin, so proteins and then chitin is polysaccharide, they might not preserve intact in the fossils, but they're so different from each other in life compositionally that we thought even if they change through fossilization, they can still be distinct in the fossil. So we looked at a bunch of Maison Creek fossils where we know what the tissues are made of. So we had many vertebrates, the lamprey and hagfish at Maison Creek and looked at their teeth. We looked at arthropods, which had an exoskeleton made of chitin. We found one mollusk with preserved radula in the field museum collections. And the radula is that toothy structure that slugs and snails have. So we analyzed that and one segmented worm with its protein jaws and then a bunch of Tolly monsters. Then we did something called a principal component analysis. So this is a statistical technique where we just cluster the, we cluster all our samples into different groups based on how similar the chemistry is based on the Raman spectroscopy. And what you can see is everything with tissues made of chitin, our arthropods and mollusks, this top orange group, form one cohesive group. And all of our vertebrates, this dark blue group, form a second non-overlapping cohesive group. And then that pink sample is our annelid, our, our um, segmented worm, which also has protein jaws. So we can clearly distinguish in the fossils, those ones that had tissues originally made of chitin and those ones that have tissues originally made of proteins. And the Tolly monster, this kind of teal green, overlaps the protein group, the vertebrate group very significantly, but does not overlap the chitin group at all. So the Tolly monster tissues are most likely originally protein rich. So if we come back and look at our hypotheses, well, the Tolly monster had no chitin. It had teeth made out of proteins like keratin or collagen. So we can cross out three of the hypotheses. Now you notice the segmented worms, the annelid, does have jaws made out of protein. So I'm being a little cheeky, I guess, by crossing that out immediately. But again, there are so many morphological issues with the annelid hypothesis that I feel comfortable crossing it out. So that paper in 2020 was the most recent paper, but based on a lot of morphological investigations in 2016 and the composition of its tissues, we think the Tolly monster was quite confidently a vertebrate, making it a fish related to lamprey. So then just coming back to the position of the eye bar and the tail and so on, well, we have now identified this medial structure as the notochord. And in all vertebrates, the notochord is dorsal. So this tells us that medial structure, when you look at it in the side to side preservation, runs along the top of the body. That's the same side as the eye bar and the opposite side is the tip of the tail. So that tells us the eye bar sits on top of the body and the tip of the tail points down. So if you accept the idea that the Tolly monster is a fish, then we know where the eye bar and the tail are oriented. Okay, so that leads us to the third question, the ecology. How did it live its life? And so this is things like how did it use its proboscis? What did it eat? And so on. And this will be the shortest section by far, which is good because I'm running close on time, but there's been very little research on this. So I'm just going to, and very little published research. So I'm just going to show you some of what I and my students have been doing recently. And this is the third topic because ecology is based on both morphology and identity. So let's give an example of how this can work. So we can get some information about the ecology of the Tolly monster from its morphology. So its morphology is like the fact that it has a proboscis. 
The Tolly monster is not closely related to the elephant nose fish, but the elephant nose fish also has its mouth on the end of a proboscis. So if we see how that fish uses its proboscis, we can hypothesize that the Tolly monster did the same. And the elephant nose fish uses its proboscis to pick little things out of the sediment. So perhaps the Tolly monster also would swim near the seafloor and pick things out of the sediment to eat. Now, what about information from identity? Well, the identity of the Tolly monster is that it's a close relative of lampreys. And lampreys have a rasping tongue. So you can see a picture of a living lamprey where the rasping tongue is indicated by the red arrow. So they use their big sucker disc to grab onto a fish and then scrape at it with the rasping tongue to get little bits of the fish tissue and get some blood that they can then swallow. Now, in my 2016 study of the Tolly monster, we identified a structure in the claw at the end of the proboscis that looks basically like a rasping tongue in its morphology. And that's the left indicated in, with a red arrow in the Tolly monster claws. So our theory is that the Tolly monster could grab something with its claw-like structure, then the rasping tongue could come forward and scrape off little pieces that were then small enough for it to swallow. So putting together the information from morphology and identity, the Tolly monster might have used its proboscis to grab things out of the sediment, hold them in its, in its jaw and its claw, and then use its rasping tongue to scrape off little bits in the sort of reconstruction picture here. But this is still hypothetical. We haven't really done research on that yet. Um, but moving on to something that we that one of my students has done a little bit of research on is the Tolly monster swimming. So fish swimming is extremely complex, but I'm going to very much oversimplify it here into two groups. There are some fish that do body propelled swimming, like a lamprey or an eel. They tend to have a very long body and very few or reduced fins, and they just flail their body from side to side to move. Other fish much more commonly have a very short body and many fins that are used in various ways for propulsion and control. But the tolling monster kind of sits in the middle, it has a very short body, but with very few fins. So how did it swim? And so my student Jay Potter looked at this for his master's thesis and is continuing it for his PhD. Um, so he basically pointed out that it's well known among fish swimming researchers that the position of a structure on the body can kind of tell you what it's used for. So at the very tail end, fish tend to have fins they use for locomotion and rudders, like the tail fin that they move to swim. A little farther forward, there tend to be stabilizers, like a dorsal fin, which the Tolly monster does kind of have. At the center of gravity, there are keels, which keep it from rolling over. And in the very front of the body, there tend to be things that produce lift or are used as rudders. Now, although the Tolly monster only has fins in a position to be locomotion, posterior rudder, and, and stabilizers, the eye bar and the proboscis are potentially hydrodynamically important features that might be used as keels, rudders, and lift producers. So my student, Jake, did something called computational fluid dynamics. So he made models of the Tolly monster and put them in a digital flow to see how different features affect hydrodynamics. And this is in the very early stages, but what he basically found is the Tolly monster is probably not a fast swimmer, but the eye bar and proboscis have a very strong effect on the flow and are likely key hydrodynamic control features. So although the Tolly monster does not have the fins that other fish use for breaking, for turning, for stabilization, the Tolly monster maybe could have used its eye bar and, prob and proboscis for similar, for similar um, functions. Um, then the tail fin with its dorsal and ventral pieces could have produced the pressure differentials for sculling, which is the sort of typical fish waving the tail back and forth to swim. And then one thing we wanted to look at was what was the best proboscis position, but that was unclear. And then, of course, it's always worth mentioning that things like digital models basically just say what is the most hydrodynamically effective, but animals don't always move in the most effective and efficient ways. So it's not necessarily conclusive but it does start to get at Tolly monster swimming. And the main takeaway is there's still much more to do, but I think now that we're finally breaking into research on the Tolly monster ecology, um, there will hopefully be much more learned about it in the next few years. Okay, I think I just made it in time. Um, so I'm happy to answer questions now and also feel free to email me with questions and comments at mccoyv at uwm.edu. Thanks. Any questions here?
questions online. I'd like to just make a comment if I could. I find this very fascinating. I've been looking for and trying to find Tully monsters forever, <laughs> as most people <laughs> have. And uh, this is really open to my eyes some, to some things that I, because I was poo pooing the whole thing about it being a chordate. And so I was really glad to hear this. Thank you for sharing. Oh, yeah, no problem. Thanks. I'm glad if it at least convinced you a little bit more towards this point of view. Definitely. Thanks. Yes, we have a question here. Yeah, so I was uh, surprised that the uh, uh, conclusion was that the eye bar was on top because I always kind of thought maybe it was in the bottom to help the Tully find prey on the on the bottom of the of the ocean floor. So is the idea that it was on the top to help it look for predators, or do we just have no way to know why the orientation was on the top and not the bottom? So we don't have a way to know for sure, but I actually suspect the reason has to do with the um, general organization of a vertebrate body plan. So the eye bar, um, we think basically is an elongation of the basic optic connection to the brain. So because the brain then connects the notochord and tends to be dorsal in the body, at least a little bit, that's maybe was the easiest place, I guess, for the eye bar to be formed. However, I actually do think the fact that the eyes are so widespread may have to do with actually keeping an eye on the tip of the proboscis and being able to see below the body. So you can imagine if the eyes were kind of high up on the body and it has this big round body, it would not really be able to see below it. And in fact, those larval fish that have the wide eye stalks and hammerhead sharks, which also have eyes on a you know, on their widely separated hammerhead, studies of their field of vision have shown that the wider the eyes are separated, the larger the field of view and the closer it comes to a full half sphere per eye. Um, so I do think having the eyes on the bar, whether it's on top of the body or below it, does allow a really wide field of view. So it could still use the proboscis below the body or in front of the body or in a wide range for prey capture. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else here? One moment. Yes, I was just wondering, is there any possibility that the eye stalks could have been of a vertical nature instead of a horizontal nature? Are there any fossils that show the, the eye stalk, both eyes on one side of the head? That's a really good question. And so I think the quick answer is I'm not aware of any fossils that suggest the eye bar could be vertical or where both eyes are on one side of the head um, because you pretty much always see the straight bar, at least where the eyes are on, you know, so it's not like making a V shape or anything. Some of the fossils may have a little bit of a bend in the eye bar, but never where the eyes are very close together in a narrow V or anything. Now, I do though think it's really interesting to think about how the tolly monster could have been oriented in the water column because things like giant squid, for example, or squid, you know, they have eyes on the right and left of their body, but they frequently swim on their side. So one eye is looking down into the ocean and one's looking up towards the sky. So I now, so I think that's unlikely for the Tully monster because of the evidence that the tail was vertical, because if it then swam on its side, then you have the issue of an asymmetric tail moving up and down to move the body. Um, but before that, when I was considering whether I thought the tail was horizontal or vertical, you know, if the tail were in the same plane as the eye bar and being asymmetric, then if the animal swam on its side with one eye looking up and one looking down, making the eye bar, you know, effectively vertical, then that would work again with an asymmetric tail. And because things like squid do that, I thought that's not an unreasonable thought. Um, but so for those reasons, though, I tend to think the eye bar was horizontal and the tail was perpendicular to it vertical. Um, but all but all these things are open to interpretation. So I know, so I, I'm not saying it's impossible, just I think a vertical eye bar is unlikely based on what I've seen. I just was wondering too, if it wasn't just a death position, kind of like what you're suggesting with the tail. Yeah, yeah. And that's something that's difficult to tease out in fossils if it could just be a death position. Um, 
And so I think in general, the, the idea that the eye bar is horizontal is mostly based on the idea of how eyes are usually positioned in animals. But we can't rule out that something in the way it died or fell or as it was transported or flattened may have changed that. Um, but just because there are so many specimens that all have a very similar looking eye bar, again, again, we don't know what exactly can happen, but it seems like if, the, if it had a different position in life, at least sometimes that would be reflected in the fossils as well. Hey, Tori, Roy Plotnik here. Uh, great talk. Uh, Thanks. Follow up on that. Do we have an idea of the composition of the eye bar? Could we cartilaginous or bone? Almost certainly cartilaginous. So there are at least one specimen I'm aware of that shows a broken eye bar, indicating that it was quite a rigid structure. And the fact that it's three-dimensionally preserved indicates that it was quite a rigid material. So if we're you know, going with the various chemical analyses, I didn't go into this in detail, but we did do the same Raman spectroscopy on various spots of the body. So we know for sure that the eye bar as well is not chitin. Um, so again, if we're assuming it's it's a vertebrate animal um, with no chitin in it, and the eye bar is a really rigid, tough material, then it's bound to be made up of wh whatever the structural tissue was in the Tully monster. So in a vertebrate with protein tissues, that's likely to be cartilage. And we don't think biomineralization because at the Maison Creek, if you have things like bones, usually you at least have some specimens where the biomineral is still present, um, which we don't see in the Tully monster. Plus, you know, with the idea of it being a cyclostome, a lamprey, or a hagfish, they just don't have biomineralization. And then I know Yasmina has been working on a way to use ramen to look at organics preserved in fossils. And even if all the biominerals have been lost, just figure out from some details of the remaining organic material whether it was ever bound to biominerals or not. And she was actually going to look at that at the Tolly monster. And so I haven't heard any results from that. Um, but I would say if you're really interested in that question, just keep an eye, you know, either ask her or keep an eye out for any research on um, the Raman, spectros Raman spectroscopy results about whether or not the Tolly monster had biomineralization that has since been lost during fossilization. Hi, my question is regarding um, the breathing. Uh, mm -hmm. Would that water be intake uh, the water intake be from the proboscis as well as as the um the food intake so we don't think so but this is one of the more speculative things so if we think about just the morphology i mean this is all this is all kind of within the idea of it being a vertebrate but if you can see on this reconstruction here right in front of the eye bar you can see my cursor but there's like a little hole in the reconstruction right in front of the eye bar so in some Tully monster specimens, there seems to be a feature in the body and kind of in front of the eye bar at the start of the proboscis. And we interpreted that as a nostril. And then there's also some evidence of gill pouches in the Tully monster, although we're not sure how many gill openings it actually had. So lampreys have multiple gill openings and hagfish just have one. And so we think it either took in water through the nostril or through the gill openings. Um, and then it would have also expelled water through there for its breathing. So we're not 100% sure about how its breathing would have worked because lampreys and hagfish bring in water and expel it differently from each other, but we don't think it was through the proboscis. Or I mean, if it was, it was through the nostril, I should say, not through the claw on the end of the proboscis. Okay, let's cut it off at this point and give us a, a few minutes in between to uh have a little bit of a break before our next speaker. Uh, Tori, thank you very much. Great, thank you.